Welcome to Engineering Innovations, the official podcast of Purdue University's Elmore Family School of Electrical and Computer Engineering. I'm your host, Kristen Malavinda. I'm the communications director for the department. In each episode of Engineering Innovations, I'll sit down with faculty from Purdue EC, talk about various things, their research, uh, their past as an engineer. This episode, though, is going to be with Millen Kulkari. He's the Michael and Catherine Burke head of the Elmore Family School of Electrical and Computer Engineering. And we're kind of going to do a state of the school thing. What's happened since the last time you were on the podcast? So, Millen, thanks so much for being here. Well, thanks today. so much for having me. So, let's just start with, you know, what sticks out for you as one of the highlights of the past year? Yeah, I mean, this is. Honestly, when I think about what sticks out as one of the highlights of the past year, it's kind of hard to choose just one. It's been a pretty momentous and transformative year uh, for the Elmore Family School. Um, I think last time that I was on this podcast, I had a much shorter title. I was yes. the interim head instead of the Michael and Catherine Burke head. Elmore Family School of Electrical and Computer Engineering. Yes. I like to joke that I have the longest title in the College of Engineering. That's just probably right. Um, yeah. So that, that is one of the changes that happened. I don't think that that's one of the momentous changes, mm -hmm. uh, but I did step in as the, the full-time hen uh, this February. Um, and I think the, ma the main change from my perspective is that I no longer could uh, push decisions off to my successor because right. I was the successor. You pushed it off to yourself. And I had to start making those decisions. Yeah. Um, but when I think about what has changed in the last year and what's been going on in the last year, it's pretty incredible. It's been a year of records. For ECE in so many ways, we're at uh, a record high, for example, in terms of our U.S. News graduate rankings. Yeah. Um, our electrical engineering program is number seven and our computer engineering program is number eight, the highest either that they've ever been, um, which is incredibly exciting. And of course, rankings are one of those things where we like to brag about them when they're good and we like to say they don't matter. Right. Uh, otherwise, but it's always nice to be able to brag. About. Absolutely. And so that's been really exciting. And I think that's just a testament to our phenomenal faculty and students and, and the research that we're doing. Uh, one of the, the ev pieces of evidence for that, which is kind of nitty gritty that you care about as a department that and maybe don't care about in other places is, um, our research activity, which you can kind of measure by how much money we're spending on equipment and graduate students and things like Great. that for our research and gone up by 30% wow. in the last year. It, it's really That's impressive and fascinating, uh, to see that happen and to see us kind of grow into all of these emerging areas of research in ECE, artificial intelligence, um, semiconductors and chips quantum computing. Um, and actually, when you list those three things out, AI, semiconductors, uh, quantum computing, uh, that's one of the other exciting things that's been happening over the past year. So last year, and I don't remember if we talked about this, but last year, the university launched an initiative called Purdue Computes. I think we touched on it last year, but couldn't get too kind of in detail yeah. about it. So Purdue Computes is kind of an umbrella that the university is using to encompass a lot of what we're trying to do as an institution to... Um, kind of invest in and grow into the frontiers of computing. And the university looks at this as having four pillars, um, quantum computing, uh, artificial intelligence, in particular, physical artificial intelligence, yeah. AI as it touches the real world, um, computing research writ large, uh, and then semiconductors and chips. And if you look at those four things, those are all things that ECE has a huge role to play in. And I think that as we've been launching new research initiatives in quantum as we've been uh, launching new centers in, uh, in, in semiconductors, yeah. as we have been hiring like mad yeah. to artificial intelligence and computing, um, you can really see us kind of firing on all cylinders in that space. So that's been an, a really incredible thing over the last year. Um, we brought 12 new faculty on. That's, that's this, incredible. This yeah. um, so it's, it's a real time of growth on so that front. When you bring in um, new faculty, yeah. how does that kind of change the dynamic of the department? It's honestly one of the most exciting things that happens, right? Um, we're a very large department. We're the largest department on campus. We're probably the largest EC department in the country. Uh, we've got about 120 faculty. But even then, right, bringing on 12 new faculty means that's 10% of your faculty uh, right. changing in a year. Um, and what's exciting about that is that when you are in uh, – you know, the, the research game, for example, you're always thinking about what's happening in the frontiers mm -hmm. of the space. And one of the ways that you stay uh, active and the way that, you, that you're able to push forward in those frontiers is by constantly bringing in new blood, right? People with new ideas, people with new ways of seeing the world, people with new initiatives, new um, collaborations. And so every time that we bring in a new faculty member, that's a new opportunity for us to think about what's happening next, right? In ACE. And it's a new opportunity for our existing faculty to build those connections, 
grow into new research areas. And so it's really fascinating when we hire people that work in quantum photonics, um, when yeah. we hire people that think about how large language models will work, when we hire people that are pushing the frontiers of distributed networks and robotics. Um, these are all people that we're bringing in this year. And those are both new opportunities for them because mm -hmm. they can come and plug into this amazing population and network that we have here at EC. Yeah, but also phenomenal opportunities for existing faculty and students to try new things. Right. Yeah, it's always good to have, like you said, a fresh perspective That's right. and make you look at something maybe a way you didn't That's right. before. So, well, speaking of things like semiconductors and AI, we have some new minors, correct, that students can participate in. Talk about those a little. Yeah. One of the things that we try to do for our students is, is be constantly thinking about how we can create educational opportunities that, that fit uh, what they want, what the market wants, and what kind of the future of this country needs. And so we have created new minors and concentrations in artificial intelligence. So students who are uh, not even ECE students, students that are in other departments that want to learn more about artificial intelligence can, can participate in those minors. Uh, we've created new minors and concentrations in semiconductors. So again, uh, students from across campus that want to think about what's happening as the country pushes the frontiers of semiconductors yeah. through the CHIPS Act have this opportunity. Um, at the graduate level, we've created new concentrations in our graduate programs mm -hmm. that focus on artificial intelligence, semiconductors, uh, wireless communications, other things that are where EC is really at the frontier. Right. Um, and what's really exciting about those kinds of those concentrations and credentials is that it helps guide students mm -hmm. through what is honestly a pretty vast landscape of things that they could do yeah. to say, Here's how you might want to think about constructing your time at Purdue mm -hmm. in order to hit that career that you're going for. Right. Uh, here's how you might want to think about uh, organizing your uh, your plan of study. Here's how you might want to think about maybe adding on something that you didn't even think was a possibility. Yeah. Right. Say you're a mechanical engineering student. And you say, wait a second, uh, I can take these classes and, and get a credential in artificial intelligence. Like, why wouldn't I do Yeah, that? right. In, in this economy. And also, educationally, we've been expanding all of our online offerings as yeah. well. I'll talk about that. So uh, our online program, our online master's in ECE, uh, has been around for several years. We're, we're the number three ECE program in the country at that. It's pretty fantastic. Yeah. Um, and it's as big as it's ever been. We've got 650 students in that space. Wow. And what's interesting when you look at that is a lot of those students... Um, view this program as an opportunity to upskill, right? They, they've all, they're all, these are full-time employees. Okay. They're already working at companies around the country, around the world. And they are able to take these courses. They take one or two courses a semester mm -hmm. and get themselves a master's in electrical and computer engineering. Um, and it's been phenomenally successful. Our students love it. Um, it's obviously very well regarded. And, and we're able to give the benefits of a Purdue education to a pretty broad slice of the country. Um, but what's interesting is that an MS in ECE does not necessarily uh, hit all of the, the points that somebody might want. Right. So we kind of looked at the landscape and said, what are some things that we could be doing that create other credentials, other master's degrees that would be exciting yeah. uh, for the audience out there, uh, for people that are looking to add that skill to their portfolio? And so one thing that we did this year, actually, honestly, under the umbrella of Purdue Computes, was uh, a partnership with computer science and we're launching a, a brand new online master's in software engineering. Oh, wow. Great. So this is now an opportunity for students to, to bring in those software engineering skills. Um, we've created a bunch of new courses so that people that maybe don't even have a software background have an opportunity to, to into this space. Right. And so that, that's a really exciting uh, tool that a lot of people can add to their, their portfolio. Um, I think one of the really exciting things about launching a master's in software engineering is that this is really the first time that computer science and ECE at Purdue have, been, have collaborated and worked together oh, okay. yeah. on a program like this. And I think it's really demonstrating the strength that we have because we have such a large and well-regarded ECE department, as well as such a large and well-regarded computer science. And when we combine our forces, we can provide a credential like this and provide an opportunity like this. So we've touched on it a couple of times how the school is the largest here and is it just continues growing every semester. So what challenges does that present to you? And how do you make sure that we can accommodate these students at the same level that we've always that's accommodated? A, that's a really fascinating question. Um, you know, if you're watching this on video, you maybe see some of the gray hair that's here. But that is definitely <laughs> one of the big challenges that we have, right? We are a top 10 department. How do we deliver that level of quality while we grow from 
1,500 students to 3,000 students, yeah. which is, I think, where we'll get in the next few years. So, so one of the things that we're trying to do uh, in order to to take those uh, that the, that group of students and give them the experience of being at a smaller school while they're at school at right. Right. How do we make sure that those students get uh, some amount of personalized attention, some amount of uh, a tailored experience? And those concentrations that we've been introducing are part of that, which is that even though you're one of 2,100 undergrads, which is right. how many we have right yeah. now, even though you're one of those 2,100 undergrads, you have the opportunity to construct a pretty tailored curriculum mm-hmm. that hits on exactly the points that you need. Right. Right. Advisors now have the tools they need to provide exactly the right kind of guidance to these students as they go through that program. But it's more than just that. Um, we've been pushing hard in creating um, better and a, a wider variety of project courses for students to take so that they have, oppor- have opportunities to uh, build the skills that they'll need when they go out into the workforce or they go off to graduate school, work in small groups with students, and feel like they're part of a smaller program, right. even though there are 2,100 of them. Yeah. Um, so this, these are some of the things that we're trying to do. We're constantly looking at how we can revamp our curriculum, how we can restructure our classes in order to uh, give students uh, the, the attention that they, they need. Right. We've been introducing a tremendous amount of additional uh, supplemental instruction, okay. extra office hours, more teaching assistance, more training for our teaching assistants, right? all sorts of things to, to help address the fact that now there's lots of students in all of these classes. And I think that kind of forming a smaller community is an challenge for Purdue in general, just because with 40,000 or whatever students we're up to now, yeah. um, it feels ginormous until you find your group yeah. and feel like it's, you, know, you found your people. And I think the watchword that we're kind of going with here is how do you make a large school feel small? Right. Right. Um, there's a tremendous number of advantages to being in a very large school, right? More faculty and more, uh, more ideas than you might get at a smaller school. More opportunities to find the student club that works for you, right? To find the research advisor that works for you find a set of classes that work for you because we can offer such a broad variety of options. Right. But that kind of thing can be really overwhelming. And so what are the things that we can put in place to help people find that advantage and find that path that you said? So in terms of, I know we have two separate degrees that we give, electrical engineering and computer engineering. Yeah. It seems to me that there's much more overlap between the two as the years go on. Is there a chance that that would be one degree or it's still, they're still different enough that they need two degrees? That's a, that's a really good question. Um, I think that, you know, gone are the days when uh, somebody wants to be, would be an electrical engineer and not need to know how to do it. At least a little bit of programming, right? right? For example, gone are the days when somebody could be a computer engineer and not have to know at least a little bit about how probability and linear algebra and things like that work mm-hmm. um, because that's, that's what sits underneath all of artificial intelligence. Right. Um, so, so you're right that there is a lot more overlap and a lot more convergence in some sense. Um, but it is still the case that there are specializations and there are directions that you might want to push with an electrical engineering degree that look pretty distinct from what you get okay. to as a computer engineer or vice versa. So our approach here has really been how do we give students as much flexibility as possible? How do we let them take the classes that they want through these concentrations or through other more flexible degree options to, to get um, the experience that they want in the courses that they need while still making sure that, hey, if you're a computer engineer with, a, with that Purdue stamp of approval, mm-hmm. that that says something about right. your abilities in computer programming, embedded systems, and right. computer systems and things like that. If you Purdue electrical engineer with that Purdue stamp of approval, that still says something about what you know about circuits and devices and, and power systems and things like that. Right. So another thing that's kind of been thrown in the mix here is the Indianapolis campus, which yeah. is part of the Purdue West Lafayette campus. It's just an urban location. How has that changed what you're doing? And are you technically the department head for Indianapolis as well? Yeah. So, you know, this is one of those situations where eh, Purdue is trying something that basically nobody's tried before. So, so just to quickly set the stage for what's going on here, um, Indianapolis is is Purdue West Lafayette, which sounds weird because it's also Indianapolis, right. but it is a location of the Elmore Family School of Electrical Computer Engineering operating in urban gotcha. So we have our our faculty, our students, our degree programs offered down there. So it does mean that I'm the department head now of a location that's 60 miles away. I've, I've been doing a little bit more driving than I used to right. in order to accommodate that. Um, but it, it's something that, that's kind of, that's really exciting. Because it's an opportunity to give a different experience to students while still getting that Purdue West Lafayette quality, right? Students that want an urban setting, 
students that want uh, more engagement with the industry because in just the, Indianapolis is a big city, right? Right. Students that want uh, opportunities, for example, to do a co-op or an internship while not actually having to leave their dorm because there's, they can right do there. it right there. Mm -hmm. These are things that we can't always offer in West Lafayette, and it's a brand new set of opportunities down in Indiana. And that's been really exciting. Um, we're also, I mean, it, it's, it's a little bit um, uh, nerve-wracking. Because Listen. we're we're growing rapidly yeah. down in Indianapolis. We all, there's 160 freshman electrical computer engineers down in Indianapolis, wow. right? Um, that's a population that, that they're, they're exactly the same as our students, right? Same kinds of test scores, same okay. kinds of GPAs, uh, same kinds of ambitions as right. our students up here. And so how do we make sure that we give them that same West Lafayette quality? Is it the same... Um... Or is there overlap in faculty too in both places? Yeah. So, so the way that we're doing this is uh, a couple of different things. Um, so we have some faculty who are based down there and teaching down there. Um, we have some faculty who are actually from here in West Lafayette. They commute down there and okay. they'll teach. Um, we've also been experimenting with what we're calling simulcast courses. So opportunities where uh, a professor uh, might be in West Lafayette and teaching simultaneously to students in Indianapolis and West Lafayette. Gotcha. Or the other way. A professor might be in Indianapolis, yeah. teaching simultaneously to students in Indianapolis and West Lafayette. Uh, but the goal is it's the same courses, the same curriculum, the same quality, same professors, same students. Just um, in a city. Just in a city. Gotcha. Another um, big thing for us has been facility improvements. And yeah. what I'm thinking of specifically right now is the Brown Hall Electrical Engineering. And we completely gutted and redid the first floor. How is what is that like and how is that going to affect our students? Yeah, so this is this was a, a huge uh, capital project um, undertaken um, over the last year um, that I think is honestly going to transform the both the undergraduate and graduate experience for our students. Um, so we took that first floor, which used to be a mix of administrative offices and undergraduate labs. And as you said, we gutted it. We ripped out basically everything, yeah. tore it down to the raft, uh, tore it down to the studs um, and then rebuilt it. Uh, Put in new windows, yeah. Uh, put in a lot more glass, and, and, and it's a lot more airy and, and well lit and modern. Yeah. Um, brand new undergraduate labs, um, with the support of a lot of, of really phenomenal uh, donors, including uh, Keysight Technologies that provide a lot of equipment out yeah. of those labs, um, but also donors like Anna Childeriff who really supported uh, CE. Those new labs uh, bring in a couple of different things. So one, we redid all of the equipment in those labs, so it is state of the art equipment okay. uh, for our undergraduate labs. Um, but it's not just that. Earlier, we were talking about some of the challenges that come with scale. Mm -hmm. um, one of the challenges that comes with scale is that we have a lot more students going through our labs than we used to. And that means that we need to be a lot more agile in how we use our lab space, right? Uh, different labs uh, grow and shrink over time. Uh, different, uh, different labs might require more or fewer benches over time. And so mm -hmm. this new space that we've created is a lot more flexible. Okay. There's there's ways of kind of reshuffling the size of yep. the labs as we need them in different semesters, um, as we need them uh, as as our student body shifts in terms of what their interests are. It gives us a lot more flexibility to give exactly the right kind of experience for it. Yeah, I've seen those like uh, garage. Yeah, doors, they're basically, basically little internal garage where doors where you can close or open depending. That's right. That's on right. The size of the class. Um, the other thing that we've done with those labs is we put in windows, and so the uh, people that maybe went through our our curriculum. Uh, a few years ago, I might remember many, many hours spent in pretty dark labs. Yeah. Uh, and that's no longer the case. Maybe that changes the atmosphere a little bit. Maybe it doesn't feel like a real uh, <laughs> a real department anymore, or a real easy lab anymore, but I think it's much better for our students. Well, I think it, it you used to walk into an um, electrical engineering building and there was a lot of like what dark wood yeah. and it just felt partially like you were going into a time warp and partially just dark. Yeah, And going in there now, you walk in and it's just bright and it just feels to me more alive than yeah. the other building. And, and part of what we're doing to make that happen is we've created a bunch of new collaborative spaces for our students. So there, there's big open spaces with desks for students to team together, to, to work together on projects, for TAs to come out and help them on things. Again, part of trying to make a big school feel small, right? right. Lots of opportunities for students to work with instructional staff. Um, so we've created a lot of those spaces. We've created a brand new lounge space for students. So, so, so nice. So Ada Kappa New, which is, which is, uh, you know, uh, have been threaded through the fabric of ECE for many, many decades, uh, runs a lounge for our students where they can get coffee and snacks and, and things like that. 
And now there's more space there. There's more light there. There's more opportunity for students to mingle. Right. And again, feel like they're part of a smaller community, even as you are in a very large school. The other thing that we've done is we took what, where the old administrative offices used to be mm -hmm. um, and ripped all of that out and put in new graduate computing labs. Okay. We talked earlier about how we're spending a lot, like, you know, the frontiers of ECE involve a lot of computing these days, whether it be quantum computing or AI or, or uh, you know, chip design, things yep. like that. So we rethought the way that we're doing graduate research space, where our, a lot of our graduate students are no longer doing the kind of research where they're hunched over a lab bench. Okay. And instead, they need access to computing resources. Right. They need the ability to sit and, and, and uh, work at a, a nice, modern, large monitor to kind of work yeah. with a modern design tools and things like that. And so we recreated, uh, we rethought what graduate research space is going to look like. And we've created several graduate computing research labs, which now house students from, uh, you know, our computer engineering area, from our networking area, from our signal processing area, from our machine learning areas. Um, so it's really exciting to see students make use of that space. Have you gotten feedback from students? And if so, what are they saying? I think that they really appreciate not being in a bunch of kind of small offices. They have just as much space as they used to, but now there's a little bit, the, the labs are much more open yeah. and comfortable. There's, there's couches that they can go rest on if they need to, to yeah. take a breather. Um, they have more opportunities to collaborate with one another because they're not in like two or three person offices with no windows. Right. Instead, they're in big open airy spaces with windows while still having their own personal space, right? Yeah. We're not trying to get rid of that. We want students to feel like this is their uh, you know, this is their space that they have some ownership of, but we can also give them a lot more facilities, a lot more opportunities to to work. So we talked about how things have changed so much in the past year. What's next? What's on the forefront in the coming year? Yeah, that's a really good question. We're we're going to continue to grow. Um, you know, we're we're this year we're at uh, twenty one hundred undergraduate students here in uh, in West Lafayette. Another, as I said, one hundred and sixty freshmen, and then two hundred other students down in Indianapolis. At the graduate level, we're at uh, uh, about 1,450 graduate students. Um, at the undergraduate level, I think we're going to keep growing. Um, there's, a, there's a big wave of phenomenal freshman engineers coming through West Lafayette right now, about 10% more than, than we've ever had before. Yeah. So they will start coming into DC, and I'm really excited to see what ideas they bring. Yeah. As we talked about, we're launching these new programs and things like software engineering, which I think will bring a brand new population of students to our graduate programs, and it'll be really exciting to see what, that, what happens there. Um, so I think there's a lot of exciting stuff happening kind of at the macro scale, right? In the CD, um, watching students taking advantage of, uh, the new project space and the new lab space, uh, the college is opening up new student project space, um, which a lot of our group, uh, student groups, like our, our robotics groups are, are really excited to take advantage yeah. of. So seeing that come to, come to fruition. Um, but we're also thinking about things at the micro scale. Okay. Um, one of the things that we're, uh, we're starting to, to really think about it is. For students that have a bit more of an entrepreneurial mindset, mm -hmm. what kinds of programming can we give them right. to make them think about uh, how they could start a company or how they could go work for some early stage yes. startups? What are, what are the opportunities that we can give to them? Um, and so we're really excited about launching some new programs there where they can uh, yeah. learn what it takes to start a company. Yeah. They can get feedback from some of our own mm -hmm. alumni who have walked down that road before yeah. when they have opportunities to build those connections and make those networks. And who knows, maybe a few years from now, we'll start seeing uh, some unicorn startups coming from, from EC. Yeah. Um, so I'm really excited about some of the smaller scale things that we're doing like that. Um, I'm really excited about our opportunities to continue uh, growing our, our research footprint in areas like computing, AI and ML and quantum. Uh, so we're, we're looking for new faculty in those spaces. So again, we talked earlier about how whenever we bring in new faculty, New ideas, right. new blood. I'm really excited to see that continue. Um, looking forward, this is these next few years are are really pivotal. I think from a national perspective, in terms of priorities, the country has. Okay, if you think about where the the United States has been investing over the last few years, lots of new investment in semiconductors and chip design, lots of new investment in quantum, computing, lots of new investments and in interest in in artificial intelligence and machine learning. And these are all areas over this, these, you know, these last uh, 20 or 30 minutes that we've talked about that ECE had a big footprint of great. Um, and so over the next five years, that push, I think is going to be this massive wave that is going that I'm, I'm really excited to see how that kind of pushes us forward, but not just how that wave pushes us forward, but how we can contribute to that wave. 
right? right? How we can grow that way and how our students and our faculty can be the ones giving the vote. That makes sense. We always want to be the leader, trying to be the first yeah. and the best and the only. That's right. And in many places that we can be. So, well, thanks so much for joining me today. And I look forward to catching up next year and seeing what changes have happened in the meantime. That sounds great. Thanks so much for joining me today and Millen Plucardi, the Michael and Catherine Burke head of the Elmore Family School of Electrical and Computer Engineering. If you enjoyed today's episode, be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. Your feedback will help us bring you more captivating conversations with our faculty and to stay updated on upcoming episodes and to explore more about Purdue ECE, visit our website at purdue.edu slash ECE. You can also find us on Facebook, X, Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube. We're all the places. So uh, you can check the show notes for more information and links to that information. We'll be back in a month with another episode.